Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sift through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. And today we're talking about... Stoicism, what it is and it isn't. And this is a show that we decided to do in part because we've, we've referenced Stoicism so many times, we thought it could be useful to have a show just about Stoic philosophy and practices. And Dan and I have both been involved in that for quite a while. We um, run the Milwaukee Stoic Fellowship here, which is a branch of the much larger worldwide Stoic Fellowship. And, um, you know, we've each been studying it on our own. Uh, actually, we know each other largely, I guess, right? Because of the Stoic connection. Yeah, I, I, I saw the, the meetup that you were running. I went in and I said, um, is this the cynics? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, Stoics. I'm like, oh, yes, that one. Yeah, and then, well, I mean, you've been actually been doing more of the meetings with the Stoic walk and talks and then... Mm-hmm. Then they became what stoic stoicism in the cafe, and then now that we're entirely online because of COVID nineteen, they're online events, right? So, right, you know, uh, it gets cold in the winter. I don't really like to walk in the the early mornings, and so yeah, went to the the cafe, and now um, you know, we've been going through oh uh, what um, Massimo Piliucci and Gregory Lopez's book. Um, what is it called? The Handbook for New Stoics. That's a um, nice. We should actually talk a little bit about that before we jump into the topic. Why? Why? You know, why did you pick that book? You you tell me what you think, and then I'll tell you what, what I think about the book. Um. So, this is actually like an expansion of just a really short document that Massimo had put out um, some years ago, with which just a whole bunch of different uh, Stoic practices and. Um, I found this one useful just because it's it's got 52 weeks of practices, and so it's just an easy way to, one, if we're meeting weekly, to have some sort of easy structure, so I don't have to come up with a new lesson plan basically every week, um, or we're just say, talking about the same stuff over and over, um, as well as it, it's, it's, it's easy to read, it's uh, fairly straightforward, and I found it to be quite useful in thinking about things in different ways that I hadn't before. I, I like it. I don't actually use it the way it was intended. Uh, and I got a, a review copy before it came out. So I got to see it a little bit in advance. And I was like, this is actually a really good book. Um, it's it's well grounded. It's got, you know, tons of content that's um, helping people understand stoicism. So I actually read around in it, just sort of opening it every once in a while to random places. And then I start at the beginning of that that week. <laughs> I just read it through, uh, and there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of really useful stuff in there. I think. Yeah, it's it's definitely a good source of practice. So let's talk about Stoicism as a philosophy that these these practices are coming out of. Um, the Stoics are one of the big schools of ancient philosophy, um, along with the Platonists and the Aristotelians and the Epicureans and the Skeptics. We call them the Big Five. And all of them offered, at least what, what people understood back in ancient times, uh, a philosophy as a way of life, a way to put things into perspective, a way to understand yourself and others in the universe, and to work on yourself and your problems so you would have a better life. And they, they disagreed to some degree on how you ought to do that and what values you ought to place as, as you know, most important or above all others. But they, they all had this in common, what um, comes to be identified later on by Michel Foucault as the care of the self. And it's not a selfish care. It's a let's make yourself less of a screwed up person so you're, you're not only happy yourself, but also less of a pain to everyone else around you. And you can fit into your society and be if not necessarily productive, at least uh, not get in the way of everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. The the philosophical project of looking towards eudaimonia or translated as either happiness or a fulfilling life. Yeah, and and, um, so we, we should talk about, to begin with, when we hear this word stoic, it's sort of like Epicurean or you mentioned the word cynic. 
these terms have changed quite a bit over the centuries. And what people call Stoic today isn't necessarily the same thing as what Stoic philosophy and practice is consistent. So this is a, a beginning obstacle for, for many people. They come in with some idea that they've gotten from our contemporary culture about what it means to be Stoic, and they may be attracted to it and think it's a, a cool thing, but then it turns out that they've, they've actually got it wrong. Sometimes this, this gets uh, talked about as the difference between lowercase s Stoicism and uppercase s Stoicism, where lowercase s would be this, you know, keeping a stiff upper lip. Um, what else fits in there? It's a, you know, think of Spock as your quintessential straw Stoic or you know, your, your fake Stoic here. You know, this idea of what a Stoic was I think from a... For, for those I, who don't know the original Star Trek thing, you got to tell them what, what's distinctive about Spock. He's all logic and no emotion whatsoever. He, he finds, like, emotion uh, bemusing or, or befuddling to himself, and he can't, like, figure that out in his, his worldview for the most part, you know, unless he's he's got, a, you know, Captain Kirk to really you know, uh, lean on for those tough to things, right? Yeah, Kirk is always saying things like, you know, it's not all chess, it's, it's poker you have to play. <laughs> and then there's McCoy, who is a rather unbridled, passionate person, you know, uh, right. well, well known for the line, damn it, Jim, I'm, I'm a doctor, not a XYZ, right? Um, <laughs> and and he's, sort of, he's sort of the foil to, to Spock. But um, there's other things that, that go along with, with stoicism as well, the notion that we should repress our emotions. I mean, Spock, the Vulcans in, in Star Trek are kind of an interesting bunch because it looks like they do have emotions, but they found ways to, to suppress them or to, to um, you know, cognitively get rid of them, except when they, of course, go into to heat, I think, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, then they're... and then Spock is the interesting one because he's like, you know, one foot in two worlds. He's half human, right, half right. Vulcan. And so he doesn't have the ability to deal with his emotions as well. And so they sometimes overwhelm him. That's true. Yeah. And so he, we get to see through his eyes these struggles to be a true Vulcan. And, mm -hmm. and yet he doesn't want to lose what the humans have to offer, right? Uh, that's right. part of the wisdom. But, you know, we, we see people talking about stoicism as if it's like embodied by, say, sports figures or soldiers, people who endure pain and aggravation and don't don't complain. And that's that's I mean, you could be a, a capital S stoic and do some of those things, but you wouldn't do it just for its own sake. There, there would have to be some point to um, mm -hmm resisting and enduring and doing all of those sorts of things. So I think that's that's an important thing to clarify, but then that doesn't actually tell us, well, what's the uppercase S stoicism? And to before we move on really quick, just you know, in in the de descriptions we have of antiquity about our mm. classic stoics, we have them described as rather happy and this is kind of, you know, at odds with this idea of like this, you know, stoic and uh, you know, little less stoic, you know, uh, emotionless person. You know, you you don't think of someone who's rather jolly. Yeah, you, you, the the notion of them being kind of grim and dour. You know, mm -hmm. um, even Cato, Cato the younger, who is sort of like a stoic hero, and some people even say maybe he was a sage, uh, a wise person. He was bold and daring um, when he was a kid. There was this guy who had taken over Rome, Sulla. And Sulla, this is before the time of Julius Caesar, who Cato fought against um, and then, you know, lost. He, he was on the, the losing side of it. Um, Sulla was... But did he? A, oh, well, I mean, in terms of the war, he certainly did. Yeah, yeah yes, yeah. he lost the war. Yeah, and he didn't lose in terms of virtue. You're quite right about that. Caesar was always kind of a loser, if we want to think about it in those terms, and and Cato and Cicero, who both fought against Caesar, with this other, you know, rum dum, you know, Pompey, who was no great <laughs> guy himself, but at least was, you know, trying to trying to maintain the uh, the Republic, uh, however bad it was. But going back to so Sulla, right? Sulla was a military dictator, and um, Cato was a young guy, and I forget exactly who he was the ward of, but Cato asked for a sword, and they're like, "What are you going to do with a sword?" And he's like. I'm going to go kill the tyrant. 
And they're like, you, you're going to do what? And he's, hey, I'm going to go kill Sulla. And they're like, you're joking. No, no, I'm not joking about it at all. I'm going to go kill him. Why would you do that? He's going to kill you. Yeah, but it's the right thing to do. You know, um, and, and he, he's, he's, you know, quite into this, this idea. And then they're like, okay, don't let that kid around the swords anymore. Um, so, you know, it, it's not just uh, joy, but also the willingness to take risks. And we could also talk about love, too. You know, that's we don't think of Stoics in the lowercase s sense as being loving, but Epictetus talks about familial affection all the time. Marcus Aurelius talks about loving other people. Seneca does. And, you know, they, they had a place for it. Right. And I, I, maybe we want to jump around here and uh, go down to uh, the idea of emotions or judgments and, and our classification thereof. Yeah, and, and you wanted to say something I know about how, and this is completely, you know, appropriate here, how the Stoics viewed um, the emotions in terms of appearances and ascent. So so why don't you start with that, and then I'll talk about the classification of them. So, you know, a lot of times we think of emotions like they happen, and then, like, they're valid. And it's like, yes, they, they do happen, and I, I like to think about emotions as they come upon us like sneezes we don't ask for them they just arrive <laughs> it's how you deal with it that that's the important point and so the stoics try to yeah you have something i like that 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 analogy actually because you're right most of the time when we sneeze it's something that just kind of happens to us and we don't realize it but you can induce yourself to sneeze if like you take a bit of snuff or pepper and i think Mm. some people kind of do that with emotions like they watch certain things so they can feel certain Mm. emotions and Uh, horror films right well, sure, that's a great example. Or, you know, people watching um, um, things where there's Romantic. a lot of romance. Yeah. Or, yeah. or watching reality TV so they can despise Ugh. people. You know, look <laughs> right. at that. Look at those scumbags there. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's completely right. And I think there's, we could say that there's environments, sort of like when we, when we go out and we know we're, we've got allergies and something's going to make us likely to sneeze, like in my case, oak pollen of all things, right? Um, Mm -hmm. If we place ourselves into situations where we're likely to run into emotional allergens, maybe there's, there's even more to the, the idea. So I, I really like that, that analogy. Yeah. And, and so, you know, the Stokes take this, you know, impression of the emotion happening upon us as, our sneeze here and say, okay, we have in a moment before we decide that we're going to assent to this emotion. And that, that moment is usually looked over, but is there, it is a place for reflection. And, and once you have taught yourself that you don't have to immediately assent or, you know, give into these emotions as they appear to you, you can give yourself the ability to say, is this a good or bad thing for me? Uh, and does it actually result in my, uh, you know, a good outcome? Yeah. And so that that's a good jumping off point for talking about how the Stoics classified the emotions. And you might say, well, why? Do, who cares about that, right? We know what the emotions are, mad, sad, glad, disgust. You know, I saw Inside Out. Um, <laughs> well, there's more than just five emotions, you know, even, even for psychologists who want to talk in, in terms of really basic emotions today, they recognize more than five. Um, and the Stoics thought that there were four big, you might call them buckets or modalities of emotion. And each of these had to do with what Dan was just talking about, judgments. So judgments about things being good or bad. Um, and whether the thing was there and you're faced with it right now or whether it's, it's off a, a way. So if we see something as good, then the general modality for that, if it's present, is joy or pleasure or however you want to talk about it. And the Stoics said there's a lot of different things that that fit into there. And um, the kind of love that we talk about is romantic love um, might might fit into that to some degree. And then um, there's the good that's not yet here, 
but which we can orient ourselves towards. Because when we see something as good, we kind of like reach out to it in our, our minds or our, our souls. And so that's desire. And desire can take a lot of different forms. It's really interesting that the Stoics placed anger in the category of desire because it, it, it is a desire. It comes from pain, but it's a desire to make somebody else suffer in return for what they did to us. And they, they actually threw a couple different kinds of anger into that bucket because there's so many different ways in which people are angry. But, you know, we could also talk about like sexual desire or the desire to be filthy rich, you know, greed or things like that. And then see Seneca's on anger. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great book, um, by the way, for anger management stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, in the, in the realm of things that we, we, we think are bad or evil and we don't want to have to deal with or to suffer, if it's right there present, then we call it pain, lupe in Greek, right? Or um, disturbance, being bothered by things. And it could be annoyance, it could be grief, it could be actually feeling sad. It could be all sorts of things. And then the things that we, we don't, we, we recognize as bad, but they're not yet here, the general orientation to that is fear. Mm -hmm. And fear can take all sorts of forms as well. And so the Stoics said that's, you know, that's where the, at least the majority of our emotions come in. Some of them said all the emotions fit into that, those four classes. Um, there's a little bit of difficulty about where to put some of the other emotions that get brought up, but we don't have to go too deep into that. But here's, here's part of the upshot. These emotions, many of them can be bad for us. And, you know, they, they don't feel great to feel. And they also lead us to doing dumb things when we go along with them. Like the Stoics thought that anger was, in general, not, not good for us. And, mm -hmm. and it's not going to be good for other people, too, because we're going we're gonna to do stupid things or imprudent things, unjust things. But there could be some rational ways of feeling emotion. So the Stoics... And here's where I think, you know, we might disagree with them as, as modern Stoics, um, but they thought that at least with three of these kinds of emotion, we could feel them in a rational way. So think about fear, for example. They said that there's a rational kind of fear, caution. So, you know, if I'm walking out in front of the bus and the bus is barreling down at, uh, on me at like 55 miles an hour, um, I probably ought to feel a little sense of self-preservation that says, oh, get out of the way, right? If I don't, there's, then I'm going to get squashed like a bug, and that's not going to be good for me, and it's probably not going to be good for all the people depending on me. Certainly not going to be good for the poor bus driver who's going to be traumatized as a result, <laughs> or the passengers. And, you know, so there's, you know, and there's, there's all sorts of things that we can rationally fear. It's within the, the scope of reason, so it's not fear that like washes over us and reduces us to, to nothing. And we can the idea is to try to maintain that reason um, as kind of leash in that emotion, I guess. That's a good way to put it, yeah. Um, and maybe guiding it too, like telling, maybe reason tells us fear this thing, don't fear this thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, like you get bit by, by, let's say you're out and, you know, playing around in the yard or something and you get bit by a spider. Um, you might feel, you know, a twinge of fear at first <clears throat> and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. Well, reason to tell you, no, you're not going to die from a spider bite. It's not a, it's not a, you know, black widow. It's probably not even a brown recluse and we don't have any other poisonous spiders here. It's going to hurt, you know, uh, maybe it's going to get, you know, discolored or something and swell up, but you're not going to die, buddy. Even if it's a big, scary, hairy tarantula, you know, uh, mm -hmm. they don't carry that much, that much venom. Um, so, so that would be an example. And, and I think that, you know, by rationally in, by having an integration of reason and that emotion of fear, it can, it can help us to avoid doing a lot of dumb things and, and also help us to keep a sense of perspective about what we need to protect, you know, and then and the last one. Yeah. Well, then there's, there's rational desire. Right. And, mm -hmm. and um, they called that it's a hard to translate term. It's bulesis. They translate it as wish. But it's, it's more like the stuff that it makes sense for us to desire. So the Stoics in ancient times were pretty, you know, um, you call them sticklers about marriage. Uh, I think that they would say that within the scope of marriage, you ought to be having and exhibiting and following sexual desire. Um, they weren't real 
big on doing things outside of that, but um, it makes perfect sense there. Or, you know, if you stop desiring eating and drinking, well, you're going to die, you know. Um, and then mm-hmm. they, they also thought that there could be rational joy, um, you know, feeling, feeling the right sense of positive, you know, uh, appreciation of the good in front of us. The thing that they thought there couldn't be any rational version of is pain or, or suffering. Okay. I, 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 don't, I don't entirely agree with them on, on that myself. Hmm. I think sometimes it's, it's, it's okay for us to feel grief. But, you know, and so, so Seneca says this too. He just says, well, you got to be rational in your grief, right? You don't like, you know, uh, bust up the place and tear your beard out and rend your clothes like all those crazy people are, you know, stay in mourning for two years after somebody dies. You know, you, 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 you mourn them, but you do so in a, in a way that's, that's befitting. And I kind of want to bring this back to, like, a lot of times people will make the argument like, oh, the Stoics don't care about emotions. Mm. And, and I would uh, push back against it. Like, you know, your emotions happen because there is something that elicited them in the first place. Yeah. And this totally. is, at the very least, that's information. And like, you know, that you got fearful about something. And so maybe it's a stick on the ground and maybe it's a stick or maybe it's a snake. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you don't know until you actually look at the stick and realize it's a stick or not, and not a snake. And <laughs> yeah. Um, and so to, Basically, all emotions. There, there is something that you know our our brain has defined as a miss, and we need to deal with it to some extent. And how you deal with it is is kind of up to you, but uh, but only if you are like looking at it and uh, not just giving into it in the first place. Because if it's a stick and you see it and you turn around and run away and scream and holler. Um, it's probably not the, the best way to deal with that particular yeah. instance. Yeah, our emotions are integral to how we take in the world and also how we approach other people, you know. Um, and they can be, you know, like well-oriented or well-calibrated and perfectly appropriate or they can they can lead us astray quite a bit. And I think we, we by the time that we start thinking about this, we're usually kind of screwed up, if not really screwed up. And usually we're not like totally screwed up, but you know, more screwed up in one way and less screwed up in another way. Um, and then, you know, uh, you know, we can, we can work on these things if we want to, we can start looking. And I guess this fits in with stoicism as well. Um, something that, that the Stoics talked about, it gets translated as attentiveness or sometimes mindfulness, prosoche in Greek, like paying attention to what you're doing. Um, and, and that doesn't just mean paying attention to what's happening with your body. It means paying attention to what your thoughts are and, and how the thoughts are connected to each other. So if you, if you notice that you keep on feeling a fear that disables you in certain situations, that might be a sign to you. I need to check up on this and figure out why I've associated, I don't know, um, drinking tea with um, this horrible fear that I have in the pit of my stomach, right? Going back to the snake thing, I was, I was actually laughing because I was just thinking of two things. One was when I used to work as a security guard late at night, when, when you're, um, you know, when you're sleep deprived, you start to see things that aren't there in the things that are there. Mm. And a stick for a snake is really common. A bush for a deer is another really common thing, too. Um, and I was thinking about that, that experience that I had. And then I was thinking about another thing too. So let's say it actually is a snake. Well, it it might not be a poisonous snake. If it's just a, a, you know, a little snake, it's probably not going to hurt you. But what if it's a giant like python or boa constrictor? That might actually be an opportunity because now here's, you you know, this is not going to appeal to everybody, but you know, if you had some big boa constrictor out in the wild, you know, that was eyeing you up, you could also eye it up. And the great thing about snakes is if you like ribs, snakes are all ribs. (laughs) (laughs) That's a little bit off topic. Yeah. So um, why has there been this revival? Like, you know, this is some kind of uh, fell away for, you know, several hundred years and over a thousand years, I guess. Uh, since well, the last big revival, it was at like the 1600s, maybe. 
Yeah, I mean, it was never it was never a totally across the culture kind of thing. They were always a minority, but all the philosophical schools were, were minorities in antiquity. But they they had a significant representation enough to actually like get exiled every once in a while for being Stoics. So that, that tells you that they were taken seriously, and a lot of Stoicism got absorbed into. Uh, another philosophical school, Neoplatonism, um, who, who ended up saying, you know, Plato got the sort of top level metaphysics right, and either the Stoics or the Aristotelians got the bottom level stuff about the world and the body right, so we're going to blend them together. There's, there's quite a bit of that. One of the great commentaries on Epictetus uh, in, in the ancient world is by this guy Simplicius who's trying to take Epictetus's Enchiridion. Epictetus, you know, for our listeners, is one of the very important Stoic figures in the Enchiridion reading is one of the beginner texts that we often start people with. It means the handbook. And so Simplicius is um, bringing all these Platonist ideas into it and, and also sort of glomming the, the Stoicism in there. And then, you know, that made its way into Western monasticism. Um, if you look at the theorists of, of that, like John Cassian, there's a lot of Stoic stuff in there. Um, and so I think in, in a way, you know, it, it never completely died. But it was there as something that was absorbed into other, other systems of, of thought and of life. And then there, you're, you're right, there's this revival in the Renaissance. They start, you know, they, they get Marcus Aurelius's meditations from the Byzantines. They, they've already had the Seneca laying around for a long time because the monks actually liked Seneca a lot. So they, they copied all of his stuff um, and they, they start finding a few bits of other things as well. And it takes off like gangbusters in the early modern period. So you've got these people like, uh, you know, that are, that are quite attracted to it, like Miguel de Montaigne. There's uh, 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 Lipsius, who's what we call a neo-Stoic, <clears throat> trying to blend together a certain kind of Christianity and Stoicism. And I think, you know, really all the way through the 18th century, people knew, knew who the Stoics were. And they, they took so, them seriously. So what, what's the most recent revival? You know, the last, uh, I would say, really, 50 years. I'd say the last, like, 25. Um, mm. and, 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 yeah, you're right. There's there's earlier works where, mostly academic works, where people were um, talking about the Stoics. But the the one that really starts off the, um, the m- most recent revival in academics would be the works by A. Long and then by... Uh, Lawrence Becker. Lawrence Becker has this book, A New Stoicism, that many people, it's sort of like the Bible, you know, a lot of people talk about it, very few people actually read it, (laughs) because it's difficult, and you got to figure out what the hell he's talking about. But it's very rewarding. And, um, you know, that's, that kind of put it, those works kind of put it on the scene. And then other people started saying, maybe this could be useful for ordinary life or for productivity or for handling my emotions. And people started, you know, paying attention to the, the um, connections between stoicism and the cognitive approach in psychotherapy, which would include not just the very popular CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, but the earlier rational emotive behavior therapy of Albert Ellis and other similar approaches. And then, I don't know, it's sort of like a snowball, you know, starts rolling downhill, gathering more and more. Uh, it gets and picked he, up by Silicon Valley and you got like Tim yeah. Ferriss and Ryan Holiday being like popularizers. Yeah, and, and, more, and because it's being taken seriously, um, people who otherwise might not have focused on it as much say, oh, I, I could... I can talk with other people about this. Maybe there's, you know, uh, a conversation to be had. And so they write books and, you know, it leads to uh, having Stoic cons and Stoic week and all, all this cool stuff that's going on, the Worldwide Stoic Fellowship and our Milwaukee mm-hmm. branch of it, right? So there, there's all of that going on. And a on. blog or something? What was that called? Well, you're talking about the one that I edit, right? Stoicism right. Today. I mean, but there's a whole bunch of other blogs out there as, as yeah. well. Um, and podcasts and mm-hmm. um, video channels. And, um, is there a radio show right now? I don't. I don't know that there is. I mean, we're talking because, about it on this yeah. radio show, but it's a radio show at the very least. Yeah, and and there could be a, a, a stoic radio sometime in the future. Uh, that would be kind of a, a cool thing to see. 
Maybe. But um, there's a there's a pretty wide range of both, um, let's call it expertise and practice and commitments within the modern Stoic community. So there there is no like agreement on some things like the Stoic cosmology or the physics. You know, the Stoics had some some views that I think a lot of people don't accept today, like the whole universe is one living thing that is really God and or reason or however you want to put it, and it's providential. it's conscious. Yeah. So that's kind of a big... Big ask, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, what, what, what you know? What would you say about that? Um, well, it's it's interesting because I've I've had experience with uh, the uh, what are they called the um, the traditional Stoic? traditional Stoics as well as the the more modern Stoics, and and I definitely move towards the the more modern Stoics in my understanding of things. Yeah. And, you know, so it, it can appeal to a lot of different people. And I, I you know, another thing I, I think we could say is a division within the Stoic community is the people who are committed to like just a portion of Stoic teachings when it comes to the ethics. And then the people who are committed to like the whole thing, like, you know, we, we sometimes joke around in the Stoic community about something that's not really Stoicism, but what we call Broicism. Which is the people who emphasize the you know fortitude or courage part, and they use some of the Stoic um, concepts and techniques, but they're really mostly about trying to become a super dominant alpha person, mm -hmm. and, and that that doesn't really go along. I mean, there's other things in Stoicism where it's, they would say that Stoicism as light packs and instead of actually as a philosophy of like life exactly yeah and, and it you know i guess one sort of hallmark and i know this is something you wanted to talk about stoicism says that our nature as human beings is social mm -hmm. and so anything that tends to separate us and cut us off from other human beings provided that they're not you know morally vicious uh to the extent that we we can't really deal with them we really should be suspicious of so if if my interpretation of stoicism says that I need to be a tough guy who like inserts myself into disputes and then, you know, just stands there resolutely, you know, uh, fists uh, clenched or something like that. That's probably a misinterpretation, right? I, I absolutely agree. It's kind of this idea of, oh, I don't want to go into it too much considering how much we have to get through, but like the idea of like living in accordance with nature. And, and one of those things is, is living pro socially, yeah, and and when, so if you're if you're doing things that result in like antisocial behavior, um, then you're you're probably going down the wrong path here. Yeah, I think I, I think that's well worth talking about actually. All um, right, you know, and this is a great place to talk about the virtues, which might put this in context. Um, because, you know, one of the virtues that we've already mentioned is, is courage or fortitude. But the mm -hmm. Stoics think that it's not really courage if it, if it goes against another one of the virtues, justice. Mm -hmm. And justice has to do with, you know, what we, what we owe to other people. And the Stoics are really, you know, unequivocal about this. Justice itself and our grasp on justice comes about because of our social nature because that's the kind of beings that we are. Um, and and one of the the other knocks against stoicism is like but where's the the benevolence and oh yeah you know, the, yeah the, the answer is it's justice you know like are the four cardinal virtues here wisdom justice temperance and courage um you know benevolence would be subsumed within that justice it's a part of justice you know we it is what we are supposed to be doing to others and how should we be dealing with them and if we are all part of this you know greater whole that of you know humanity or the rational beings then when we attack another we are in in of itself attacking ourselves you know that's actually another really important feature of stoicism that we see in the text a lot, especially in Marcus Aurelius, right? But also in the other thinkers who we've, we've mentioned, this notion, 
Go ahead. work together like two feet left and right with the work together like the you know, upper and lower teeth they yeah. can't work together you can't they don't work if you don't work together with them yeah and the notion too that if if a part of the body or a part of any sort of whole decides that it it's the thing that matters the most it becomes no longer properly functional and mm-hmm. you know we're so used to thinking of ourselves in very individualistic ways. And I think some of that is because of our culture. Um, we're probably at a, at a small disadvantage being Americans uh, because there's so much stress on my rights and my liberties and all that, that sort of thing. Um, but a lot of it, I think, comes from, from the emotions as well. Fear, for example. If I don't like look out for myself, nobody's going to take care of me. So I've got to be you know, very self-centered and don't give anybody uh, any opportunities um, to, to you know, screw me over or anything like that. If we look at ourselves, even when we're in relationships that are flawed or you know, definitely non-ideal, as being in something that, as you know, like the, the phrase goes, it sounds a little new agey, something bigger than us, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the Stoics really did believe in that. You know, like, so you and I are friends, for example, and we're also like co-hosts of that. Insofar as we're doing this, there's something that's more than just you or me. Um, there's the, let's call it just the relationship itself. And that has some value and that requires some nurturing and that provides us with a kind of orientation or perspective that allows us to do this, this activity that we're involved with right here. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I think we can look at so many other things this way. And this is where a lot of relationships go bad. And, and stoicism can help us with relationships. If we look at the relationship primarily as this is something you've talked about quite a bit in the past, zero sum games. But we could also think of it like in what can I extract from this relationship? You know, mm-hmm. um, if we look at if we look at things in, in that sense, we're we're starving the relationship we're we're not allowing it to to grow and we're, we're hurting ourselves in the process because you know we according to the stoics on some basic level want to be connected with other human beings and and maybe you know maybe beyond that we, we maybe right. we want to be connected with the rest of the world so it kind of bringing it back towards the you know living in accordance with nature yeah you can look at this as uh, i believe chrysippus puts it who is the the second head of the school or is he the third 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 um and um he's the second founder exactly yeah yeah there you go um just because of his body of work and um he kind of divides it up into you know you've got the nature of the universe, we can think of that as like physics. And then you have this nature of living things. And so all living things have a feeling of self-preservation. And you might want to you know, extend to that uh, if you want preservation to also reproduction. Uh, well, and flourishing too. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And, and then we as humans have an extra level of, of our nature, which is our nature of reason, which supervenes, which is... That's a fancy word for meaning that it's it comes after, but it then um, changes the things that happened before it. And so first we have these uh, our nature of self-preservation, and then and then we have reason that can like change what we would do. So we're not just acting as I guess automatons here. Yeah. And so a, a good example of this would be like a a parent sacrificing their life for their child. You know, like at at first glance, people or you know, animals or whatnot would not want to lose their life, but we have some sort of reasoned uh, decision making that says, okay, this is actually more important for me to do this than for me to continue living. Yeah, and and the reason thing is really interesting, and this doesn't just apply to stoicism. Um, it's it's kind of a across the board thing, and it's not just in Western philosophy too, but also in in a lot of <clears throat> non Western, you know, like say Indian or Chinese philosophy. There's this realization that human beings are distinctive animals, and part of what you know what allows us to transcend our merely animal nature, but not become gods or angels or anything like that, um, is this faculty of rationality which also includes speaking it includes like our cognitive processes and stuff like that but it's still rooted in our our animality 
And um, it also, it, it not only can make us like able to function well together and like make plans and do all sorts of cool stuff. It also makes us the most dangerous animals. Mm. We can be the most destructive. Um, we can, if we, if we don't use, it's not, a, it's not like reason is just a set of processors that automatically go the right way because they've been coded properly. As a matter of fact, you know, it's like coding that can recode itself and often has all sorts of bugs in it already. <laughs> There's massive lists of cognitive biases and fallacious oh, yeah, yeah, reasoning. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're, we're, it takes work <laughs> to not. That's it. Yeah. So, so that, that putting in the work, that's really central to stoicism, right? Right. And, and so virtue are those actions that we have deduced through reason to be those actions that result in the like the best ends, both for our own personal enjoyment of life, our eudaimonia, um, but also for the our our social position at not position, but like our social groups are mm -hmm. the, the those groups of people that we care about. And the Stokes would say that that's all rational beings. We should so we should the, mention th what the other virtues are too. So I, I we, did. We, Oh no! I don't. I don't. I, we should talk a little bit <laughs> oh. more about that. So yes. I mean, we talked about about justice uh, quite a bit. That it includes benevolence and it's part of our social nature. We and we've also talked about courage. I think, but mm -hmm. you know, the Stoics thought that wisdom was, or prudence, is another way of putting it, was absolutely central, and that um, we need to cultivate that. And they gave us all sorts of techniques and insights for developing that. But also they talked about temperance. That's an old fashioned word. Um, we translate it nowadays often as self-control or moderation. I'm not sure that it, it has quite the same tenor in, in mm. those. How important do you think temperance is for the stoic life? Uh, very, <laughs> uh, in, in a word. Okay. Um, because you know, I guess everything in moderation, and uh, you know, for example, water is life-sustaining, but too much water is toxic. You know, and yeah. and so goes with most <laughs> things in life. You know, uh, you know, sex is pretty good, but too much sex, and that's gonna make it so you're not doing any of the other things that you're required to do to be a, a good person in your community. Um, and you know, if you've got other obligations and you're failing to do them because that's all you're doing, I don't know why I picked well, that particular thing, but that is a example. no. It's a, it is a it is a great example because we do live in a society where, um, although we've now figured out that the advertising adage that sex sells is actually wrong, it it, it doesn't actually help you to sell products. It if you have a, a sexy commercial, it does get people very interested in sex. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, it's something that that we you know is constantly being thrown at us because of you know the fashion industry and our media and the ubiquity of pornography and you know you name it right mm -hmm. um, and it and, and you're right it can lead us to not um, recognizing other values it, 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 there's something about that drive that um, and, and, and again sort of distinctively human right. Um, dogs are dogs want to have sex. Elephants want to have sex. None of them will like spend hours on end, um, you know, doing all sorts of weird things that cost them lots of whatever the equivalent of money is for dogs. Um, trying trying to get you know get involved with somebody else. Um, we do that, and that's that's partly where our rationality is is our um, greatest strength and our greatest weakness. So if we don't have that particular drive in some control, you know, integrated to some degree with reason, we're really in, in a bad shape because it's not just sex too. It has to do with, you know, uh, the feelings of affection that go with it and how people use it to be a compensation for the lack of other, you know, goods or pleasures in their life. That's a, that's a really major one. Same thing with food. You know, it seems yeah, like a, I was thinking ice cream. Yeah, it seems like a trivial thing, but man, I mean, we're we're an obese nation, so you know, there's clearly something going on. Um, so, so temperance is a very important aspect of the Stoic life. Um, should we talk about the? There was an interesting question that I, I found in one of the Facebook groups that I think um, fits in well with what we're talking about. 
Yeah, and I think we'll have to uh, come back to this major topic again because there's still we're definitely going to have to do some more shows on the table. On this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So somebody wrote in, and and you see stuff like this every once in a while. This is in one of the Facebook groups that after practicing stoicism, and he didn't say exactly how long he was doing it. He found himself numb, disengaged with little interest in things, and he expressed the worry that that stoicism had damaged him. And it didn't take long before a whole bunch of people weighed in and they were like, buddy, you've been doing stoicism wrong. And, and it might have been better to say, you haven't actually been doing stoicism, you've been doing something else in the process. So that, uh, what would volcanism? you say? Well, <laughs> I mean, the, the Spock thing, maybe that well, wouldn't be quite that bad. But Well, well I, I thought of the, you know, going just straight to Vulcans instead of just Spock because he's got that oh. spark of emotion there still. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it seems like he's, um, instead of uh, welcoming those emotions and observing them and uh, dealing with them, he is just stuffing them down so to the point where he's not feeling anything that he's getting to that numb space and it doesn't seem like it's been particularly good for him yeah and and i think people do things like that sometimes because they want to insulate themselves off from a harsh out, outside world that seems threatening or disappointing or however painful however else we want to talk about it or maybe it's a way of dealing with trauma and it, and it's dangerous to do in part because um habits do determine us. So if you constantly take your disappointment and then just shove it down and then put on a, not necessarily a happy face, but at least an impassive face, after a while you lose the capacity to deal with that emotion of disappointment, to be able to linger with it and say, well, what am I disappointed about? What a stoic would do with disappointment, for example, is say, I feel disappointed. That's an emotion I'm having. What's going on here? Why am, I, why am I feeling it? What are my thoughts? What are my judgments that are leading me to feel this way? Are they accurate or are they off base? And how, how would I know the difference, right? And Is the thing that I'm disappointed about under my control or is it something outside of my control? Yeah, there you go. Or is it, is it something that doesn't really have any value? Right. Right? Um, so, and we could talk about all sorts of other uh, motives or spurs that might lead a person to do this. But I think the force of habit is something that we have to be really attentive to when we're, we're thinking about these sorts of situations. So I feel, I, I kind of feel bad for the guy um, that he probably created more work for himself on his path to um, personal development or, you know, transformation towards happiness. Cause it sounds like he made himself pretty unhappy by doing something that's, you know, sort of that lowercase s stoicism rather than actual stoic teachings. And now, he's making progress in the wrong direction. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Now, is it progress if you're going the <laughs> wrong way? Well, it, it, you're progressing somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it feels like you're making progress at the time, but then you need a, a, a sense of perspective. You need something like a map to mm -hmm. get you... Um, you know, a map and a compass, I suppose you could say, so that you know where you're actually going. Um, right. Now, if, if I feel bad for that guy, is that non-stoic? What do you think? You feel bad for him. No, because I think you're wishing him to have a better outcome in his life. That yeah. you're, you're desiring for him to have a more, you know, happy, you know, fulfilling life, and he's definitely got the, not there. Yeah, he's, he's, if not gone in the exact opposite direction, because at least for, maybe he's developed some self-control, you know. Mm -hmm. He's certainly gone off of the path, and he's out in, I don't know, the fields or a cul-de-sac or something like that. Right. <laughs> I don't know, life is a maze, and sometimes we hit those dead ends. you got to double back a little bit. That's an interesting point of view, too. <clears throat> the, the notion that we have to be able to recognize when we've got things wrong. Um, I think that's, that's where maybe we can also say genuine stoicism is something very different than the impassive kind of stoicism that would like hide our 
mixing things up, right? Marcus Aurelius over and over again says, hey, if I've got things wrong, tell me I've got them wrong because I, my, my goal is not to like do things my way. My goal is to actually get things right. Or Epictetus constantly talking about, you know, who's the slave and who's the master in this thing? You know, if you're uh, constantly being uh, tugged here and there by your emotions, or I guess mm. in this case, the lack thereof, um, and and now yeah. he's getting an emotion of uh, you know numbness. I don't know is that emotion or just a total lack of emotion, but it's definitely if it doesn't feel good, then you are you know uh, you're now a slave to this particular position, this mind state that you're in. That's interesting. So a part you you would be a slave to a part of yourself, right? Mm-hmm. But a part of yourself that shouldn't really be running the show. You could say, because the reason is supposed to be the thing that's ultimately running the show. Yeah. Oh. Well, that's. So, I think that's a good answer for that that particular problem or, or question. Um, should we there, now? Stoic practices. I think we could actually like do a, an entire show just on practices. Right. Um, but we had one in mind that we wanted to. <laughs> Oh, that's right. With the book. Yeah. We had one in mind that we wanted to bring up that that's particularly useful for, for people and you can start applying it right away. And it, it doesn't take an awful lot to, to think about it. And if you keep doing it, you'll get better and better at it. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's so, different, different ways of talking about this. Some people call it depersonalization, which doesn't mean you quit being a person, but you quit making everything about you. Right. So I guess this is uh, we tend to see to tell ourselves that we have to do that, but not everyone else does means that we're doing it contingent, but not necessarily. Yeah. So when we feel or think or react to something, we tell ourselves we have to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, I don't know what for for, for me, um, when somebody is driving slow in the left lane, that tends to tick me off. I don't, I don't, mm-hmm. Does that bother you? Uh, it did until I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area and had to deal with that all the time. <laughs> and then I just kind of like shed myself of this thing because it was – otherwise it would have killed you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Three-hour yeah. commute every day. Yeah, it yeah, would have killed yeah. me. <laughs> so I, I'm not at that point yet. And I – you know, if I get stuck behind somebody – um, you know, I'll actually take action too, by the way, I'll, I'll like flash my lights, you know, mm-hmm. and sometimes like point, get out, you know, get out of the mm-hmm. road. Um, but if I tell myself that the feeling of irritation or aggravation, it's something that I have to do, I'm lying to myself. Why? Because, well, I mean, you'd be a perfect example. You don't do that, right? When, mm-hmm. when, when you're driving along on, you know, I-94, uh, and some idiot is in the, the, the side lane and they're going 55, which is the speed limit. And, you know, you're not supposed to go the speed limit in the left-hand lane. You're supposed to be going at least 10 over, right? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a weird unwritten rule. Um, but but it's totally the rule, at the very least. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's probably 10 because 11 miles an hour, at that ups your, uh, at least in Wisconsin, the, the amount that you have to pay. Exactly. Well, the cops uh, won't pull you over for 10 over unless, oh, yeah, unless it's a really bad matter. day. Yeah. Yeah. It's, like they, it's not worth their time. They like to see you going 10 over because <laughs> you know, then traffic is flowing. So so if I can say, well, when this happens to Dan, he doesn't do that. What does that tell me? That tells me that there's nothing in the nature of things or nothing in the nature of me that makes it necessary that I have this reaction. So, you know, like Epictetus would say, listen, Socrates didn't fear death. So therefore, you do fear death, but you don't have to fear death. There's nothing about the nature of, of you know, the world or human beings that says that you have to do that. But we can use it, you know, in this, this trivial example as well. And when we realize that, it doesn't mean that we quit feeling it. But right. now we have some leverage. We can, we can talk to that thought or feeling and say, hey, you're not necessary. Uh, you don't have to go that way. And then we can also gain a little bit of leverage. We can like start looking at it and saying, what's wrong with me? Why do I do this? Why do I feel this way? What's, what's going on? And we can start pulling at some of those threads to undo that knot. Right. Uh, 
the whole idea of like, oh, he provoked me, doesn't hold water in this case. And for I've now, why a, not? That's a, that's a good example. Why why doesn't well, it? Well, like, uh, here's an example I had this week, and I went to the grocery store, and I walked by a gentleman as I was walking into the store, and and we both were going to the same section of the store to pick up. Apparently, both were picking only up one thing. <laughs> I, I get there first because I've got a quite quick gate. Okay. And um, and I, I pull my item and I turn around and he's there and he's flipping me off. Wow. And I'm like, and I'm just taken aback. I was like, I don't know what I did to provoke you. Um, but then I'm like, okay, well, that's his problem. And I walk to the the checkout and he comes up and he stands right behind me in like there's several lines but he could have chosen to go a different one and he stands really <clears throat> close behind me and he i feel like he's trying to provoke some action out of me and i just yeah like, um i turn around and i'm just like oh man it's so nice that it's spring and it, the weather is starting to get so nice and you can be outside and i'm just like i need to personalize myself to this person because he's just seeing me as someone that apparently has insulted him i don't know exactly and how. has taken his thing <laughs> there was he it was definitely not that i think he had a different item not to mention there was a number of other uh, duplicates of the item that i had oh interesting yeah, I, I don't know, but, you know, it was the, I could have been provoked. Yeah. Um, he, he was doing things that, for many people, would have provoked them, and uh, I realized that I had the choice in that moment, even though my body was reacting, I felt the <laughs> adrenaline go through my body, Yeah. Um, that I didn't have to do that angry reaction there. I could deal with this in a totally different way. Yeah, you know, so that's a great ending point. Stoicism is something that is empowering. It's it's not something that subjects us and, like, makes us statues or people who are, you know, dour and, and uh, unhappy all the time. It's it's supposed to make us happier, right? And right. I imagine there's, there's a sense of, like, not just liberation, but like, oh, I can actually do this. That comes with having that, that experience, right? Yeah, and, and the end of it was that he he responded to me in at least you know civil civil terms, yeah, and and he, he backed up a few paces. You might have actually helped him too. I mean, we'll talk much more in other shows about all sorts of ins and outs of stoicism, but you never know whether you planted a seed in him that might turn into something. Hopefully. So, last thoughts. I'll let you have the last word as usual in this show. All right, so. Here's a quote from Epictetus in his discourses. People are upset not by things, but by their judgments about those things.